This talk will be about uh, dunder methods, what they are and how they can be used. We'll come to this shortly. Uh, it's a new talk for me in the sense that there are slides, but I will also try to do some live coding. So please be patient with me. But at least uh, VGA works, so I think uh, yeah, it's already a good start. So um, as already said, it's not about some kind of uh, a container service, but we are really focusing on Python uh, containers and uh, collection types and how they are related to double underscore methods. So first, this dunder is really a, just a D, which is then a short abbreviation for double underscore or more commonly known maybe or even not, I don't know, as a special method. And special methods are very important in Python because they, if we want to quote the documentation, they allow classes to define their own behavior with respect to language operators. And when I first discovered uh, Dunder methods, it was really like, oh wow, this is where all the magic happens when you have uh, square brackets to access an element or when you type whether some element is in a list, so the in operation or when you just want to add to two objects together, then uh, Dunder add is invoked in the background. And when I realized this, I was, wow, so this is, this is actually something that uh, is very elegant and can be used to uh, express what I'd like to model in a very natural, in a very natural way. So since I'm a bit lazy, I will most, uh, most often use just Dunder method for it. And it's not that I am, pronouncing it badly, it's really just a D, a thunder method. I don't think the word exists anywhere else outside the Python world, but there we are. So a thunder method uh, is what you're talking about, and we're talking about thunder methods related to container types or collections, because I think choosing the right container to store your data or to model uh, your data is uh, very essential part of every program and it greatly influences the design, how everything uh, will then evo evolve. And since this is also quite a large topic, we will focus on basically two aspects. First, how we can represent data. And the second one, if I have some kind of container and I'd like to make it look like or behave like a built-in one, how can I achieve this? So we will not talk about metaprogramming. It would really be focusing on learning and embracing Thunder methods. And what we aim for is that after using a built-in, what is the next kind of logical step if the plain built-in does not really satisfy our purpose? Before we go further, let's clarify what is a container. So Maybe there's some kind of ambiguity in the language, but in, in the Python world, if you, something is called a container, if it has, uh, if it holds some other objects, and this is then basically expressed if you can ask, for example, if you have a list, whether some element is in a list, and this is then pretty much the same as calling a dunder contains method on the list. So if you are using special Python syntax, syntax, namely in, what is actually going on in the background is that some uh, method on the object is invoked, namely it under contains, and then you check whether it's in there. <clears throat> so if you want to see if something is in container, you basically have to ask whether some special method, the dunder method, dunder contains method, is there, and if you want to do it even properly, there is a collections, uh, in the collections abstract base class module, an abstract base class for the container which does this for you. So if you have something and want to know if, you are, if it is a container, you check if it's an instance of this abstract base class. A collection on the other hand side is already a bit more than just a container, namely it is sized and it's iterable. And this is what you usually are looking for because you want to iterate over something and um, yeah, get items out of it. If you turn back to, to the list example, let's say we have a list of three elements, and this is obviously sized, we have three elements, and if we 
call the len function and plug in a list. Of, of course, in this case, it's three items long. And this is the same as invoking dunder len. So if you want something to operate in conjunction with the len method, you have to implement a dunder len method for your object. It's iterable, allowing us to do what we really like about Python, that we can simply iterate over an iterable in this very easy fashion, just for item in list, and then we do something with the item. Again, if you want to know something is a collection, first it needs to be a container type, second it needs to be sized, and third it needs to be iterable. Therefore, basically, we have to check these conditions. Slightly better, again, in the collections abstract base class module, we have a corresponding abstract base class, and this is basically what we are looking for. So we are actually in this talk more, um, more discussing collections, but yeah, I mean, this is just how it is defined. There are actually quite a lot, if you have not yet um, taken a look at. I think when, you, when one starts to, to learn Python, you really make uh, progress very far, fast, and you may overlook some of the more, more exotic, like um, collections or container types like default dict or counter, which are super useful, so even if you haven't heard of them already, yeah, you are encouraged to take a look if you like. So, let's come to the first example. Let's say you are a PyCon CZ organizer, I guess there are some here, and you want to ask um, some questions to your prospective participants. You make a survey, and in our case it's just an example, so it's a very short survey. First, whether you like PyCon CZ. Do you like PyCon CZ? Okay, oh, I hope you're a bit more enthusiastic when, <laughs> when the organizers ask you. I like it here. Then the second question could be, do you go to the party tomorrow? Do you go to the party? Yeah, okay, let's see. And of course, a very, a very hot topic these days, GDPR. Maybe you are expected to say, yes, I, I want to opt in because I want to receive emails, for, for example, for PyCon CZ 2019. So, if we want to model the response of these questions, the obvious choice is that we just use a tuple and we store the results. So I like PyCon CZ, I will go to the party and please send me more emails. So this is how you do it. But the point is that it works. I also think that using a tuple is, is a good choice because it's immutable, it's also cheap. It does not save as much memory, it doesn't require as much, manage, as much memory. Um, compared to, for example, when you use uh, your own, some kind of uh, uh, object to hold it because you don't have to dict overhead because everything is uh, going over slots. But on the other hand side, true, 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 doesn't hold any meaning. So if you get this result, you have no clue what is it about. This is pretty much like uh, the problem with arguments or keyword arguments when you have arguments of the same type. It's really hard to understand what they're going, what this is going about. And second, there's always the question, maybe I want to support default arguments in my container, or maybe I want to do some kind of input validation up front so that people cannot even enter wrong answers. For example, if you have the survey, and then you ask people, do you like PyCon CZ? And then they click no. Maybe you just want to forbid that they can say false to this. Maybe, it's, it's up to you. So the in the end, it's always, at least for me, the question, I would like to have all these features, and on the other hand side, yeah, am I really going to need it? So there is this Yagni, you ain't gonna need it, which kind of discourages you from implementing features that you don't read right now, that you don't need right now, and I think that's a really good point. So the question is, how can I find a proper compromise that allows me to start with something that is really cheap, but still allows me to add features as I need them. So we will therefore take the next uh, step, and now we will go for, for a short demonstration, and let's see whether we can do it. So this is a bit small, right? Ah, and it's cut off. Um, but it's okay, right? I think you can 
follow the code. So this is our result object. And the first and most obvious problem is that it's not self-explaining. And this is something that you usually strive for, that the data containers that you provide really speak for themselves. So maybe you already know it. There is the collections module, and the collections module provi provides a named tuple, which will therefore import. So from collections, import, import the named tuple, and then we define our own result class, which is then the named tuple, which I call result. And then I have field names. The field names will make it self-explaining. We have the PyCon CZ question, we have the party question, and we have the GDPR question. And if I now create a new result object, I can just drop in my original result, and if I take a look, so it looks decently, right? Because now I have named attributes. If I want to access them, that's not a problem. So if I, if here I just can access like the PyCon CZ result, I don't have to remember if it is the first, the second, or the third argument. This is I get for free. Because uh, what the named tuple does, I get a nice wrapper, and I get a nice Thunder wrapper uh, implementation. So if the reason why this is implemented nicely is because I don't have to think how the actual input or the actual data is presented. So this is the necessary method that you need to implement if you want what you have to be properly displayed. So again, here is a very important Thunder method which is related to the representation. So I think this is already much better than the plain tuple because now it's self-explaining. So what, we've, what we did here is, let's add it here, make it self-explaining. So that's nice. So this is something that we did. The problem is still here that if we take a look at the result, now it's PyCon C set. It's still not clear where it comes from. So the, you may be inclined to say, hmm, whether maybe there is some information contained in this object that tells me what this attribute PyCon CZ is all about. But actually, there is, of course, nothing in here. It's just an alias for field number zero. That's obviously not very helpful. So what we need here is some kind of documentation. And there is this nice saying, docs, or it didn't happen, right? So how can we achieve to get some documentation in here? That's actually quite easy. We just add documentation. So documentation is again stored in Dunder doc. So there is an, a special attribute, in this case, that stores the documentation. So we can say this is the result of PyCon CZ participant survey. Of course, it would be nice if you could add documentation to the fields as well, and we can do that because they also support a doc attribute. So do you like PyCon CZ? Yes, we do. Then we have other, like the party question, and it was like, what was it? Do you go to the party? I think something like this. And then we have the final one, the GDPR question. G GDPR, yes, there we go. Um, do you opt in? Right, because in GDPR you have to opt in. It's not opt out, but you have to opt in. And if we now ask for help, this is what we get. So now we also understand what these fields are good for. So now it's already self-explaining, but maybe what about default arguments, right? It could be that since GDPR is opt-in, it should be false by default. So if you don't explicitly say, uh, yes, I'm fine, send me an email, it should be false. So the question is, what about defaults? Let's 
that's actually also quite easy because there is Dunder New. We will come to Dunder New shortly. Um, and as every function, it has uh, defaults, right? So we can say none, none, and false. So what does it mean if I just instantiate such a result object is that now I have default arguments. I don't really have to, to supply all values. I can just set the defaults and say, OK, if you don't tell me anything about GDPR, this is false by default. That's already nice because it's, it's everything in here. The last question was whether we can try to do some input validation, right? Input validation. So this is maybe a bit more tricky because the thing is that we use an immutable object here. And what we would need to do for input validation is that before the object is created, we actually check whether the values are valid or not. Which means that this is um, everything here is a tuple is that we have to overwrite uh, new, under new. But we will, we will manage to do this. It's actually not, not a lot of work. So we come up with a new class. I just call it valid, which is subclass is the result object. And what we need is that we overwrite new. New gets the class as first argument. And then we just consume some, some all other parameters. And what we would like to do is that we then call the new of, of, the, of the parent, and he, then we pass the class, and some kind of sanitized keyword arguments. Okay, Let's call it all quarks. So this is what we would like to do. Okay, And then we have here some input validation. The problem is you could pass inputs as arguments and as quarks, so we have maybe uh, have to merge them somehow. Therefore, let's define a new dictionary that contains all the data that we need for in instances, instantiation. And um, what we basically do is that we just collect everything that was passed into it. The nice thing about the name tuples is that they have a field, a fields attribute here. So if you want to know what's going on in the name tuple, you can just take a look. So we just merge first the arguments, and then we update with the keyword arguments. Then we have all, all the data that the user plugged in, and then we can check whether it's fine. So here uh, we use fields, and here we have arcs. And then we make all quarks dot update with everything the user supplied. And now we go for input validation, OK? So for key and value in, in everything that was passed, for all these items, we can do something like uh, some, some simple check. For example, if value is not in. Uh, <laughs> Uh, if it's not true or false, because we only enforce true and false, and then we raise, uh, raise a value error, right? So this is something that we can do, raise value error. And then we need some, some kind of more or less descriptive um, message, which could in this case be something like um, key um, only supports true and false and false, and then we tell the user what was actually passed, maybe something like here, the actual value that was passed, and there we are. So let's check if this does something reasonable. We create a new result, a valid result. Uh, for example, with PyCon, CZ is like, I like it a lot, which is also good but it's not allowed in here. So let's check what happens. What we get is a value error, because PyCon ZZ only supports true and false. I like it a lot was passed. And if I, on the other hand side, just say I like it, 
then it's fine. Party, we didn't set party, it's still none. GDPR is per default false. And now we have a container that is actually pretty capable of doing a lot of things. So we have documentation. It's self-explaining, it has default arguments, and it also validates its input. And we have all this because we decided to, from the beginning, change to, uh, like we switched from just a plain tuple to a named tuple. So, to summarize it, ideally you want a data structure that is self-explaining and that also aids your development process itself. It should, it should be that it really, if you read just the code, it's, it speaks, it, it tells you a story. And if you move away from just using a plain tuple, um, and for example, instead using a name, name tuple, you can then incrementally add features as you need them and to default arguments, input validation, type checking, and all this stuff. There is, uh, life is actually coming, becoming a bit easier in Python 3.7 with data classes. If you haven't heard of them, it's quite nice. If you can't wait for Python 3.7, you can do pip install data classes as well. So they are backported to Python 3.6. If you write a lot of classes of, of for container types, you may also want to take a look at editors, which is quite nice. And if you don't want to write classes, there is a nice talk, Stop Writing Classes by Jack Dietrich, but it's a bit of a different flavor. So the second example that uh, we'll take a look at is a small data processing application. So what's basically going on, I have two folders. So to say, in one folder there is all my input data and I want to load it, I want to process it. Once I have the data processed, I want to dump it again to another folder. So this is what's basically going on. Meaning that I have some kind of mapping between input and output data. And if I want to go through this process, there are actually quite a few things I need to know, namely how the files are mapped, I need to know how the data is loaded, I need to know how to process it, and I also need to know how to write the data back to disk. And this could be, of course, much more complicated because maybe loading evolves some uh, yeah, some, some database connections and some, some merging and whatever and also writing the data could be much more sophisticated and the user or maybe the person that is actually analyzing and actually processing the data is only interested in the blue step up here because the rest, all the remaining steps should actually take place in the background. So the question is if you have some kind of setting what is a nice way to separate data handling and data processing? Because if you want to focus on the data processing, maybe you want to analyze something, you really don't care how the data is stored, how it is related, or how you save it back to disk. You want to, you want to move this overhead back uh, away and then really focus on the data itself. So one way to do this is that if you go back to the, to the picture here, is that you try to provide a mapping, like a, a co container that provides you with data and also takes care of saving it back to disk. So the example, the second example here is, this is just code, you can uh, ignore it. Basically what we, what we know is that there is a mapping between our files. So I'll just show you. How it's supposed to look like. So here we have our raw data and then uh, the results are supposed to be in the processed folder. So let's so there is this mapping, somebody needs to know, okay, we know in this case, there is a load function and there is also a write function. And the question is now how we can, how we can glue these components together. And if you want something that feels like a mapping, uh, here, I'm in the wrong, I'm in the wrong file. So we know how to map the files. We know how to load the data and we also know how to write it. And the question is, how can we glue it together? And 
if you say it feels like a mapping, maybe you want to inherit the corresponding abstract base class and then implement something that, uh, that feels like, like a mutable mapping. It behaves like, but it does something different in the background. So let's take a look. From collections, all abstract base classes are in the collections.abc module. Uh, import mutable mapping, and then I say, I want to define some, some, something that we call data mapping, for example. It should be a mutable mapping, and I want then want to use it in a way that if I do something like for key and data in dm.items, I get the data that is on disk just in here, then I can, let's say, data processed. It's just like, in this case, it's a very simple operation, 24 times data, and I want to write it back to disk by just assigning it back into the container. So the question is how we can achieve this. This is basically a mutable mapping. You can do this by simply inheriting from the corresponding abstract base class, and then you will get a number of errors that tell you exactly what to do. So even if you're unsure what exactly it requires to implement a mutable mapping, you simply start to inherit from it, you instantiate it, it won't allow it because it's an abstract base class that will raise uh, corresponding errors and everything that you need to do is that you then go through this list of thunder methods. Again, in this case, some, some five of them that you implement and you're done. So <clears throat> let's see how far we can go. But for example, we need something that is called getItem, okay? So we need uh, a method, getItem, and getItem needs a key, okay? And here we want some kind of load operation. The question is, how do I know where to load from? So basically our data mapping needs to know where the data resides. So let's make it that upon initialization, we pass the path mapping, we pass a load function, and we pass a write function. Okay, and then we set these attributes, self path mapping, which is just a dictionary with input and output. Um, and then we have the load function, which is just a small function, and then we have the write function, which we also assign here. And if I then call get item on my special data, data mapping, what I basically want to do is that I want to return what the load function does when I load the, from the path mapping the key and the input value to the corresponding key. Because we decided to have it structured like this. For every file, I have an input file and I have the path to the corresponding output file. And if I implement this, I just grab the corresponding file, I load it, and I return it back. Then we need our set item. So we can also write something back to disk. We obviously need a key and a value. And what we do in this case is that we call our write method. The write method receives the data as well as the path. So we have the value and then we have self path mapping for the corresponding key. And now it's the key related to the file that we write back to disk. So that's fine, we don't have to return anything. What else? We need to make it sized. So we need to implement some dunderlen. Dunderlen is basically calling the len, dunderlen on the underlying mapping that we have here. We need to support iteration, which for a mapping should return the keys so that you can iterate over it. In this case, we can just call uh, iter on again the, the path mapping. And then we can support delete item, which takes a key, right? You have to decide which key you want to delete. In this case, we just don't implement it because we don't have time, okay? So let's see what happens 
if we do it like this, so we pass a path mapping, we pass a load function, and we pass a write function, and we have invalid syntax, because I'm missing some. Um, ah, here. <laughs> yeah, that's a challenge of return. Where is it? Ah, here. Ah, no, this one was right. This one. Ah, oh. oh, damn it, I'm blind. Yeah, 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 yeah. Here it is. Uh, yeah, maybe you should, you should. Yeah, okay, that's fine. So, so this is super ugly because we forgot to implement a wrapper, done the wrapper, so without the wrapper everything is a bit ugly usually. So what we can return is uh, this is wrapper. I leave it to an exercise because we don't have time, but now it's a bit, a bit nicer. And once we have it, we can check whether it worked. It has a len, okay, that's fine, so it's sized. We can ask for the keys, which is just file one and file two. This is also nice, and we can check whether now our operations here work by checking whether some files were produced. So here we had the raw files, and here we have the processed files, and there they are. And what we achieved is that we completely, uh, data processed actually, so we have completely hidden all the data handling. As a user, you only have to know how to iterate over a dictionary or how to use a dictionary. Everything else is completely hidden. And you can really focus on how to multiply something with 42. <clears throat> so to summarize it, if you want something to behave like a built-in, all you need to do is that you go to the website, go to the documentation, take a look at the collections that are there, then you inherit from the abstract base class, see what errors are raised, and then just implement all of them. You get all intermediate methods in a, in, in a way that they are derived. It may be more efficient to implement them directly, but, for ex but it's, a, it, it's, it's a good start to, to use it like this. If you want to subclass like a dictionary or a list, it may actually be easier to subclass user list or user dict, uh, just as a side note. And if you are often in the situation that you have something that is like a mutable mapping and you want some caching and stuff, there is a SICT library, which is part of the Dask project, which is also nice if you want to take a look. So that's it from my side. I'm not exactly sure if you have questions or not. But um, yeah, for me, Thunder methods were uh, quite, uh, quite a discovery. When I first learned about them, maybe you already knew it, maybe there was something new, hopefully. I'll put, uh, I will upload the slides in the afternoon, so if you want to, to revisit the examples, they will be available on my GitHub account. Thank you. All right, thank you, Klaus.